This podcast is part of the Big Heads Media Podcast Network. Go to BigHeadsMedia.com for more great podcasts. Welcome back to another edition of Pistons Thoughts. I'm your host, Jordan Letterman, and today we have some things to talk about. The direction of the Pistons year may have been determined by the bad news yesterday that Blake Griffin is going under season-ending surgery. And anybody watching him this year knows that it's sort of about time that he gets shut down for the foreseeable future. Blake Griffin last season had his best season, MVP caliber, one of the most exciting players the Pistons have seen in a long time, and it finally gave this fan base something to, to get behind and to love and to cheer. But... This season has been completely different. If you've watched him, you know he doesn't look healthy. The Pistons are worse with him on the floor this year because of that. And he just never found a rhythm, never looked like himself. And hopefully this surgery can bring him back to the full health that he was capable of last year. Now, we don't know that he's ever going to get back to how he was last year or in his Clippers days, but... If he's fully healthy, I have full faith that he can figure some things out and still be a really good basketball player at the end of the day, but priority number one is getting him healthy. On the other side of that, it really gives some clarity to this Pistons season. Right now, they're sitting at 14 and 24, which is still only three games out of the eight spot behind the flailing Brooklyn Nets, but three and a half behind the seven seed Orlando Magic. Now, you have a couple options here. First of all, you can fight for the 8th in the 7th seeds. I mean, you're only three and a half games out, but here's my take on things. I think that you don't do anything to push for it in terms of making moves to sacrifice any asset to get any piece that will help you chase that 7th spot. But, let's say hypothetically the Pistons get rid of Andre Drummond. As has been rumored, and apparently around the league, confidence is that Drummond will get traded by the February 6th deadline. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but let's say you go ahead with that, and then your young guys lead you to that 7 or 8 spot because it's in reach. I think that is a huge win. I know a lot of people are like, let's blow it up, tank the season away, whatever. Here's the thing. This has essentially been the worst case scenario season for the Pistons. They go into this year with higher expectations. No one predicted Blake essentially being out for the season. No one predicted Reggie Jackson essentially being out for the season. Luke Kennard has missed plenty of time. Markeith Morris has missed plenty of time. The Pistons have essentially played a lot of their season with one point guard, and that's Derrick Rose, who's been phenomenal, by the way. But you're not going to get very far with one point guard. So... Everybody's been hurt at different times. The Pistons haven't had one game at full strength, and it's really pushed them into this corner where they're not chasing the five or the six spot, and they're not really in a position to give anything up and and put themselves in the top half of the Eastern Conference. That's just not going to happen this year. But on the other side of that, even though it's the worst case scenario outcome for the Pistons, it's not necessarily bad the way things are unfolding. You have Sekou Dumboya who all of these injuries has opened plenty of time for, out of nowhere, Dwayne Casey decided instead of giving him two minutes in a few garbage time games, he was going to throw him into the starting lineup against Kawhi Leonard and the Clippers. I was at that game. I'm not saying that I'm a good luck charm and I'm the reason this happened, but it's not a coincidence that Sekou's first real NBA game came when I was in attendance, but I digress. But Seku has looked phenomenal, and all these injuries have opened up opportunity for Seku, for Sfi Mihailuk, for Luke Kennard when he's healthy and playing, for Bruce Brown, who's just been thrust into a starting point guard role, which, by the way, Bruce Brown has never been a point guard in his career, college or whatever, but he's been, he has the tools to be a point guard. Dwayne Casey thinks that long-term he's going to be a point guard, but before this season, he hadn't played any point guard other than in the Summer League, which he showed flashes of being really good, but that's the Summer League, and you really can't look too much into it. So Bruce has been thrust into a role that he's not comfortable with, but he's been improving and getting better. Sfi has been getting a lot better. Sfi was a fringe rotation player at best going into the year. Granted, it's his second year, but he wasn't in the rotation to start the year, And all of a sudden, he is looking like your best shooter, he's making strides defensively, and he's just getting better overall. But that leads me to my Seku point. This kid has been doing a great job in the G League, and he's been... Okay, listen. 
Seku's been playing basketball professionally since he was 15 years old, and he really wasn't playing much before then. So, when you're someone who's only been playing basketball for five, six, seven years, every like three to six month increment is you're going to be able to see huge growth because a he's learning the game his instincts are getting better b he's adjusting to a whole new country language all that fun stuff c when you get to the nba level you need to learn the personnel you got to learn the guys on your team you got to learn every player that you're guarding in the league you got to learn tendencies you got to learn schemes you got to learn so much coming into this and he just turned 19 years old but he was playing great in the G League. He was getting better and more aware offensively and defensively each and every quarter, let alone each game. And by the time he started his first NBA game, which he was thrown into the goddamn fire against Kawhi Leonard, the next night against Draymond Green, the next night against LeBron James, the next night against Kevin Love. I mean, these are all star players that he's guarding, really good players that he's been just thrown against. And... It's been remarkable to see each and every quarter he's just getting better, more aware. Granted, he's making mistakes, and I love it. Because that's what this season has turned into. It's just learning. It's just throw the young guys out there, put them in a position to play their best basketball. They're going to make mistakes, and I promise you with Dwayne Casey and everybody, they're going to be so much better for it, especially Seku and all the other young guys. Not to mention Seku Dumboya potentially ended Tristan Thompson's life uh, last night with a phenomenal incredibly inconsiderate jam on his head could have jumped over him in my opinion but you know it is what it is. it's it's game four essentially for Segu, so we'll, we'll give him some time to start jumping over people but my goodness I haven't seen excitement from from the Pistons fan base since we got Derrick Rose that was a lot of fun everybody loves Derrick Rose everywhere and I absolutely love Derrick Rose but I have not seen this energy for this losing team in so long and now Seku is playing. Sin- Ever since Seku's first start, this fan base has been re-energized. And especially last night, having a piston or two even, Derrick Rose is getting some attention too, but having a piston or two getting positive national attention is so exciting. And especially with Seku, again, he's 19. The Pistons drafted him this summer knowing that it was going to take some time for him to really be a contributor. But from day one, Super high ceiling, really high upside. And, you know, the floor was the was the scary part. That was the risk that you were taking. But I think every single game, I think he's showing absolutely four games into this thing for real that he's here to stay and he, he belongs here. He's never going back to Grand Rapids. And I think not only is his ceiling looking more and more promising, but I think his floor has absolutely risen. And, like, at worst, he's he's going to be what you've been seeing, which is... You know, a double-figure scorer, he's a solid defender. Granted, he, again, he's making mistakes, but overall, he's playing really well. And I think every time he makes a mistake, Casey will talk to him, Dre will talk to him, somebody will talk to him. He realizes that. You can tell from what everybody says and from watching him that he wants to learn and he wants to get better and he wants to be the player that we want him to be. And I think he is putting himself in such a position. And finally, Dwayne Casey has put him in this position and this is so exciting. Now, we are a month away from the NBA trade deadline, and rumors, as I mentioned before, confidence around the league is that Andre Drummond is going to be on the move. Now, here's the tricky part with Drummond. He has a $28 million player option. All signs point to him opting out, but here's the thing. On the Piston side of this, if you're not planning on paying him long-term, the best move is to trade him, get something for him, rather than let him walk for nothing like they've done with Greg Monroe, like the Hornets did with Campbell Walker. You can't let your best player walk for nothing. But on the other side of that, you have the teams that are interested in him could be reluctant to trade for him when in reality it could turn into a year rental. But the plus side of trading for him is you get that half a year rental, you keep his bird rights so you can go over the cap to sign him and all that fun stuff, But also, it's just sort of a tryout, and you can sell him on the team, and if it works out, you might have a better chance of keeping him, but you're committing to paying him long-term if you trade for him, because otherwise, what's the point of giving up anything for a half season of him if you're not planning on keeping him this summer? And again, the one drawback is that in reality, 
the teams that are trading for him most likely have cap space this summer and could just outright sign him. So his value is absolutely extremely complicated, and I know a lot of people don't think the Pistons can get much for him, and they're probably right, but something is better than letting him walk for nothing. Now, as it stands right now, after Woj dropped the initial bomb that Atlanta and Detroit were having semi-serious discussions about it, there have been a handful of teams that have, have emerged as possible suitors for Andre Drummond, which could be phenomenal for the Pistons, because no matter who thinks that, oh, maybe someone won't give up too much for him because of the player option and he could possibly be a free agent this summer, but if multiple teams are seriously interested, and we don't know how serious any of these are, but if multiple teams become seriously interested, it doesn't matter. All it takes is one or two GMs to overvalue him, and you got yourself a bidding war, which would be the absolute best possible scenario for the Pistons in this situation if they decide to ultimately move Andre Drummond, which all signs point to they will. So right now, the list of teams that we know of are the Atlanta Hawks, Charlotte Hornets, Dallas Mavericks, Cleveland Cavaliers for some reason, Boston Celtics, and Toronto Raptors. Now, I know the Kings have also had interest in him in the past, so we'll see if they come back as a possible suitor here and can make a run at him. So let's just take a look at what maybe all of these teams could, will, should, and maybe are going to offer. You got the Hawks, who it looks like they were discussing that Brooklyn Nets 2020 lottery protected pick, which would probably be in the 16 to 20 range, depending on how the Nets do. But the Nets, as I mentioned earlier, are sort of in free fall. They've lost seven in a row. They're in the eight spot now. That pick becomes a little more risky than you thought it would be because if they drop out of the playoffs and it's a lottery pick, that pick does not convert till next year. And I know that sort of scares off some people how worth it is getting a pick that's going to be in the late teens when it also might not even come to fruition this year. But it looks like they were discussing that 2020 Nets pick along with maybe the expiring contract of Chandler Parsons or Evan Turner. And Woj mentioned other assets. I'm not sure. People aren't too high on Cam Reddish, but I feel like he would be the one young asset that the Hawks would be willing to get rid of. And it's, you know, it's a, it's another guy with sort of a low ceiling, high upside kind of guy. Reminds a lot of people of Stanley Johnson. It's a conversation for another day. If talks get more serious, again, I wouldn't be mad at it because, like I said earlier, it's better to get something then let him walk for nothing. And I know people are like, oh, you're not getting nothing, you're getting cap space. Yes, but the Pistons aren't going to use that cap space this year unless they go after Fred Van Vliet, which has been reported again. But I don't think that cap space is as valuable as getting another first-round pick and another young guy who, whether you like it or not, he's 35, 40 games into his rookie season. There, there's time there. It's, it's a low-risk, sort of high-reward move again. So I wouldn't be mad at that particular deal. Granted, I'd love to get something more for Dre, and I don't even know that we're going to be able to get that much, but if that's what it is, it is what it is, and I'm okay with that because you're getting something. Now you have the Hornets who have shown interest. You're not getting Devontae Graham, otherwise you pull the trigger on this without talking to anybody else around the league. You're probably not getting a Miles Bridges, you're not getting a P.J. Washington, maybe you can get a Malik Monk and a protected first again. It's not the best deal in the world, but if you're getting a first round pick somewhere, and if you're getting a young player who, you know, might not pan out, but at the same time, that that's why these young players are available, because they're low risk, higher reward, maybe not even high reward, but medium reward. Just having one of these young guys who you can throw into your core, who can just, you know, even if at best it's a role player, that's still worth the risk rather than letting him walk for nothing. So that's the Hornets option. The Mavericks option is the least appealing to me. They can offer a pick, maybe the the contract of Tim Hardaway Jr., maybe a Dwight Powell. It just doesn't really appeal to me. I don't, I don't love that. Because the thing is, if you're trading Drummond, it's not just for a salary dump. You got to be getting some asset back for this to be worth it otherwise you let him walk you know you don't want to necessarily take back long-term money but again get something that's the least favorite option of mine you got the Cavs option which I don't understand because I feel like out of all of these places Drummond is the least likely to re-sign in Cleveland but I don't really know for sure what's going to happen there 
Doesn't seem like Kevin Love is a fan of Colby Altman, so maybe he can give us a little deal on something. When you look at the Cavs, you can look at picks. They got some expiring deals. A lot of people earlier in the year were saying that maybe Colin Sexton is going to be out of the picture there. And here's my take on Colin Sexton. Especially after watching him last night in that Cavs game, we're going to get to see him again tomorrow. But he can score. He will get you some buckets. But he is not even close to a point guard. He, If fans were frustrated with Reggie Jackson just dribble, 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 they're going to absolutely loathe Colin Sexton. But here's the thing with Sexton. If you keep him not as your starting point guard, but maybe as your six man, and maybe at some point he develops some point guard skills, you know, that's that's not the worst thing in the world. He's young, he gets you buckets. It wouldn't be the worst thing, but again, I don't think the Cavs would give that up, so I don't really understand why the Cavs are interested and what they can offer. Celtics are interesting, but I don't necessarily see them giving us anything of value because Danny Ainge is... The biggest tease when it comes to his assets, he'll stockpile his assets and not make a move for anybody, but he'll be involved with every single big name ever. So if he wasn't willing to give up assets for Paul George, for Jimmy Butler, I feel like he's not going to really give up too much for Andre Drummond, so I don't necessarily see them as a viable option. And then you have the Raptors, who's actually a really interesting option. In the summer, talking about next summer... I mentioned the Raptors and the Hawks as the two best landing spots for Drummond if he became a free agent, which it looks like he will. You pair him with Siakam, with Lowry, who a lot of people wanted in Detroit earlier this year because I think a a Kyle Lowry Drummond pick and roll could be pretty good, and that's with Trey Young as well. I think that could be great too. But I think the Raptors are a really intriguing option. They got some expiring deals. I'm not really sure what asset you get back. You get a first-round pick from them, maybe, but the problem with that first-round pick is it's somewhere in the in the mid to late 20s, probably. If you're lucky, it's early 20s, but still, how worth it is that? And some people mention maybe Fred Van Vliet can come back and the Pistons can begin to sell him on next season. But the problem with that is if the Raptors make this move, it means that they're going in for it again this year, and I think they need to keep Fred Van Vliet around for that to happen. So those are the types of deals that are possibly available for Drummond. But like I said, all it takes is one or two teams to overvalue him, create a bidding war. There's less than a month to go. And I think if the Pistons, who have this easy stretch of basketball, can start winning this, I think that puts a lot more pressure on the other teams because when they're in free fall like they have been, it's very obvious to everybody that, like, okay, like, They just need to get rid of him. Like, there's no point in keeping him. But if they start winning, that creates a little more leverage for the Pistons, and I think that can be a really good thing. Now, the Pistons have a couple other players who I think could actually garner some trade value around the league. We're talking Langston Galloway. I think Markeith Morris and Derrick Rose can be some pretty big vet moves that can be made as well. Now, Langston Galloway is the most interesting because Langston, first two seasons in Detroit, overpaid, underplayed, and was just super inconsistent. But this season, he came in, he clearly worked over the summer, he got so much better, and has been potentially the most consistent player on the Pistons all season long. And he's an absolute sniper, and he I th- he has to be second in the league behind James Harden in four-point plays. He has to be. Now, the thing with Langston is, if the Pistons... okay. Let's let's talk about this for a second. The Pistons have two ways to go about this now. You go all in on a rebuild, and, you know, it doesn't have to be a five-year plan, but you go all in on a rebuild, and let's say they don't do anything again until the summer of 2021. This season's a wash. Next season, they're just like, let's just keep our young guys, keep them all out there, and let them play, and whatever happens, happens. Or... They can sort of re-up for next year. In this, it kind of sucks that the trade deadline is so soon because you'd like to see how Sfi and Seku and Luke and Bruce end the season to sort of know where you want to go with this next year. Because if Seku makes these strides as he has every single week that he's played from the G League to now in the NBA, I mean, and Luke Kennard keeps making his, his strides and he's 16 to 18 points a game next year, And if Christian Wood figures it out on a consistent basis, I don't think he's the answer at the center position, but I think at the power forward position, he's great. 
But if these young guys can figure it out and keep progressing and have another productive summer, this isn't necessarily a 30-win team next year. Like this, they could be sort of where they're at now or where they were last season in the in the 40 plus range in the low 40s, high 30s and fighting for something. So if that's the case, then maybe you bring back a Derrick Rose next year. Maybe you bring back a Langston Galloway. Because the thing about the playoff push that a lot of people don't understand, if the Pistons were fighting for the eighth seed with the same team that they had earlier this season, that's not worth it. That's regression. You can't do that with a healthy Blake Griffin, with Reggie Jackson, with Derrick Rowe. You can't just push for the eighth seed. But when it comes to the young guys, with Blake being shut down for the year, with Reggie Jackson not playing this year, maybe maybe he's shut down for the end of the year too and probably not coming back next year. If the young guys led by Seku, Sfi, Bruce, Luke, you know, with a little help from Derrick Rose and whoever they get back in the Andre Drummond deal, if those guys are fighting for the eighth seed or the seventh seed, like, give it to them. You saw the the progress that Luke Kennard made last last summer coming off of that playoff push. Because Luke, with Blake out the first two games of the series, was the Pistons' number one offense in the playoffs against the best team in the league. That was Luke Kennard, and then he came in this this year, and he was putting up 16, 18 points a game. He dropped 30-plus in the in the opener against Indiana. So if you can get that same experience for Sfi and for Seku especially, I would love to see Seku in the playoffs. I feel like his intensity would go up by crazy, and I just, I just think that experience would be super valuable to them. But the main point of this is the Pistons have to decide whether they want to do what they did with Reggie Bullock with Langston Galloway and maybe Markeith, who has a player option, who's, you know, I think he's played above that that low contract that he has, so I think maybe he'll opt out and get a different deal. But if you can get any sort of first-round pick for Langston, for even Tony Snell, who I don't necessarily see the Pistons moving, but if you can get a first-round pick for any of those guys, you have to do it. And then you have the Derrick Rose conundrum, who arguably has been the best player this season other than Andre Drummond. He probably has. I don't know that it's arguable. But the problem is he's on a minutes restriction, and it's got to be around the 28 minutes a night mark. He played 30 for the first time all season last night, and he put up 24 and 7. Wasn't super efficient, but those are the numbers he can get anybody. And you look at a team like the Lakers or like the Sixers, like either one of those playoff teams who want to go for it this year could absolutely use Derrick Rose, who's putting up 18 off the bench and can get you some buckets in crunch time, or Langston Galloway, who's an absolute flamethrower and can can knock down threes around any of those guys who are struggling with a little bit of spacing. So it's going to be really interesting over the next three to four weeks on is Andre Drummond gone? Who's he going to? And what the hell is this package going to look like? Is Langston Galloway gone in a Reggie Bullock type deal? I would say that if Jordan Clarkson can get you two seconds and Dante Exum, I think Langston can get you equal value to that. And the Dante Exum trade is interesting because that's the type of trade that if you get right, it speeds up everything. You get a young player in Exum who, you know, is underperforming, not living up to the expectations, but he's still young and he can still figure it out. Again, low risk, medium reward. I don't know if that's necessarily high reward ever in those situations, but it's a low risk move. And that's the type of move that I think you can make as the Pistons. But again, if first round picks are offered for Langston or for really anyone, I think you have to do it. So it's going to be really interesting, but for the first time in a long time, the Pistons fan base has hope. And that hope is absolutely led by Sekou Dumboya, who has been phenomenal in his four career starts, essentially his first four NBA games, because before that it was all garbage time. And if his current trajectory holds, this is going to be really exciting way sooner than we thought. So let's see what happens. Detroit basketball. I'll talk to you next time.